Several years back, a book came out in Thai, a collection of sayings from the different forest ajans. And the name of the book was Yoni So Manasikan, or the Pali would be Yoni So Manasikana, which we translate as appropriate attention. This was considered such a distinctive part of the forest teachings that they wanted to name the whole book after that one principle. And the usual translation in Thai of Yoni So Manasikana is finding the appropriate strategy. So it's a distinctive part of the teachings that you want to be strategic. And that you're here to figure out what's going to work and what's not going to work in gaining your release. That requires that you question, that you investigate, experiment. This is an aspect of the teaching that tends to get lost, especially with the emphasis we often hear on acceptance and equanimity. They just accept whatever comes and be passive, patient. Well, it's important to know where acceptance comes in the practice, where patience comes in the practice. When the Buddha was teaching meditation to his son, Rahula, he starts out with the teaching on trying to make your mind like earth. In other words, people throw disgusting things on the earth, but the earth doesn't recoil, doesn't experience revulsion. Make your mind like water. People use water to wash away disgusting things, but the water doesn't get re disgusted. Same with fire or wind. Fire burns disgusting things, wind blows disgusting things away. But the fire itself, the wind itself, doesn't get affected by this. And so the Buddha's teaching, patience up front as an essential quality you want to bring to the meditation, but it doesn't stop there. Because after that he taught Rahula the sixteen steps of breath meditation. And these involve exploring. Breathing in long, breathing on out long, breathing in short, breathing out short, then figure out how to breathe in and aware of the whole body. Noticing how the factor of the breath, bodily fabrication, can be brought to stillness, how it can give rise to a sense of rapture, how it can give rise to a sense of pleasure. There's an active exploring aspect here of the meditation. So it's not that you just accept things and leave them where they are. You accept the way they act, and then you try to make the most out of how they act. It's like the ideal scientist who comes to an experiment may have a few ideas of how he wants the experiment to turn out, but he has to have that basic patience and equanimity to design the experiment properly and to be honest when the experiment doesn't work. That's the only way the scientist is going to learn. If it doesn't work the way he hoped, well, he can come back and design, design it another way, see if that works, or learn something new that he hadn't expected. That's how learning happens. It comes from patience and equanimity, but it doesn't come from just sitting there and being passive about the whole thing or simply accepting everything. Because the Buddha's analysis of suffering was not that we're neurotic. That's the problem with neurosis, is you can't accept things. He's saying simply that we're not paying careful enough attention. We're not being skillful enough. We're not asking the right questions. He broke questions down into four categories, the ones that deserve categorical answers, the ones that deserve to be reanalyzed before you answer them, the ones that require cross-questioning before you answer them, and the ones that should be put aside, that don't deserve an answer at all. And the categorical questions come down to basically two. The question of what's skillful and what's unskillful, and then questions framed in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Those are the most categorical of his categorical teachings, the only ones that he actually describes as categorical in the canon. 
And so it's questions derived from those issues that you should be applying. And this is what appropriate attention is all about. You pay attention to these questions. You look into them. You actively try to figure things out in terms of what's skillful and what's not. So when you bring the mind to stillness, it's not just the stillness that's going to bring awakening. I was talking last night to someone who was of the impression that insight meant a sudden energy flow in your body, and that was it. There's a lot of misunderstandings out there about what insight is. It's an understanding into cause and effect. And John Lee gives the example of getting some silver. He says, and if you don't take the silver and smelt it and try to make it into different things, you don't really know silver. If you know causes without effects or effects without causes, you don't really know them. You have to see the connection, because it's in the connection that the whole issue of skillfulness arises. You're going to do something and you hope for a certain effect. If you get the effect and it really is good, okay, then you know that the action was skillful. There has to be that relationship between cause and effect for the whole notion of skill to make any sense to begin with. And the Four Noble Truths are also based on a sense of cause and effect. Suffering and stress have a cause that you can trace down and find in the mind. And you can do something about the cause. But you have to be able to notice cause and effect as they actually happen. It's not simply a matter of going through the motions. The Buddha says, do X and you do X and don't think about it. The Buddha himself, in the course of his quest for awakening, directed his quest through questions. He noticed, here, I'm doing this this way, and this is not getting good results. How about if I tried that? He was looking for happiness and things that aged, grew ill and died. He said, wait a minute, I'm subject to these things too, and if I look for happiness on this level, I wouldn't have anything to show for all my efforts. What if I tried to look for a different kind of happiness, a happiness that didn't die? And then he tried various courses of action. When he found that a particular course didn't work, okay, he tried another one. And part of figuring out what worked was that he would look at the results he got and he said, okay, do these really measure up? That was a, an important part of the questioning process, was looking at the results and seeing, do these really measure up? Is this really an end, end of suffering or is it just a nice way station? Or is it something totally off the track entirely? It's because he kept his standards high in that process of what he would call cross-questioning. He was able to attain awakening, as he said. It was because of his lack of contentment with skillful qualities that he attained awakening. In other words, he didn't just rest content with something nice happening or a nice little opening or a level of concentration, he asked himself, is there still suffering of any kind? And if there was any suffering, any stress left, he knew that he hadn't found the path he wanted yet. So he'd try something new. And so when he came to teach, he wanted to encourage the same attitude in his students. On the one hand, he would be very open to questions, but when he would give his talks, he'd always frame them as questions and answers. He said, there are five, say, strengths. Which five? There's always that question, which five? How many? What are they? Then he gave you the list. And if people came to him with questions, he was open to answering them. As long as he felt that the question was sincere, he was happy to answer. And he encouraged people to ask questions. What does this mean? How should this be understood? How should this be applied? Those were questions he encouraged his listeners to ask. He said there are two kinds of teachers, the teachers who encourage cross-questioning and the teachers who teach bombast, as he said, just nice words that everybody likes to hear and they can sort of get a nice buzz from the words. But that was not the kind of teacher he was. Because he said the teacher, the teacher who teaches bombast, you end up with people not really understanding anything. They're not clear on the meaning of the words, because they're not encouraged to ask. What this meant was that he had to be very clear about his words, what they meant, how they should be applied. 
And then he gave his students checklists. These are the things you look for in your mind, he would say. If you can't read other people's minds, at least learn how to read your own mind. Is there any greed in your mind? Is there any anger? Is there any aversion, lust, envy? Down a long, long list of possible things. So if you find any of these things, you've got to work on them. And if your meditation wasn't working, he'd encourage you. Okay, what's what's not going right? He gave the analogy of a a cook working for a prince. The cook would fix lots of different curries and then notice, okay, which kind of curries does the prince reach for? Which does he ask for? Okay, the next day's meal, okay, he'd fix more of those kinds of curries. And as a result, the, the cook would get a reward. But said in the same way, when you find that your meditation is not going well, you've got to ask, okay, what's going wrong? What's missing? Drill yourself on this. Because this is the only way you're going to get any, pra any, <clears throat> any, any progress in your practice, and the only way you're going to come to an understanding of cause and effect through what works and what doesn't work in the mind. Even his questions on what are commonly called the three characteristics are actually really three perceptions, inconstancy, stress, and not-self. He posed those as a series of questions on what's working and what's not, what's skillful and what's not. So you develop a strong sense of concentration, and you've mastered enough so you can start investigating it. And the questions are, say there's form here in the concentration, like the form of the body, the, the breath, the earth property, the wind property, the, the water property. Is this constant? And in states of concentration it can seem very constant, but you've got to look very carefully until you see even the slightest little bit of inconstancy. You say, well, if it's inconstant, is it easeful or stressful? And you, and you see there really is a rise in the level of stress. And then when he gets to the question about not-self, he doesn't say, okay, do, then do we come to a conclusion whether is, there is or not a self? That's not what he's asking. He says, is it valid? Is it skillful to claim this as yourself? Are you really going to find happiness if you claim this as yourself? That's the basic question he's asking. It's a question on what's skillful and what's not. When you can see clearly, no. You can let it go. Then you go through the feelings and the perceptions and the thought constructs, the fabrication, the consciousness that's aware of all these things. And you examine these things in the same way, even when there just seems to be just a very bright, bright awareness. You still have to question it. Is there any inconstancy in this awareness? And sometimes the concentration can be so strong that you have to look at it for a long time and be very subtle in your powers of observation before you see the inconstancy. But again, there's a question. Is this something easeful or stressful? If it's stressful, is it valid to say this is me or mine? Is it skillful? Is this going to be the way to do happiness? Because after all, the happiness you want is something that is not subject to inconstancy or stress. This is where appropriate attention leads you. It takes you all the way. It shows you the questions to ask. And encourages a questioning attitude. We're not just here to accept. We're not just here to be passive. Just patient, just equanimous, and leave it at that. I remember listening one time to a tape of a number of people who'd been over staying with one of the Ajans in Thailand. It seemed like all of them had learned those lessons. It was important to develop patience, it was important to develop equanimity and acceptance. And unfortunately, the, the Ajahn got so sick that he had to stop teaching, but that was all he got. That's, as far as they were concerned, that seemed to be everything. But you talk to the Thai monks who studied with that Ajahn, you know there was a lot more. learning how to question things. Once you had learned the principle of accepting the way things are, the way things happen, okay, then you can explore the way things happen. 
to use it to your advantage to find. Okay, is it possible to find a happiness that lies just beyond acceptance? Is it possible to find a happiness that has no problems at all? Because acceptance often involves having to put up with things that are unpleasant. But equanimity is not nirvana. The Buddha is very clear on this. He says you can get stuck on equanimity, and that actually prevents your gaining awakening. You have to break through to something that really is deathless. And you can only do that by questioning, by figuring out what's working and what's not, and having very high standards for evaluating what's working and what's not. So this is why the way the Buddha questioned things is a really important part of his teaching. It's essential. He found that it was essential in his own quest and encouraged it among his students. This is why he said, of all the qualities you can develop inside, all of your inner qualities, there's nothing that is more conducive to awakening than appropriate attention. <laughs> 